Yeah. 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 Yeah.
uh, 900 nuclear warheads uh, to China's traditionally small nuclear arsenal, even though we don't know if China is planning uh, to uh, deploy uh, uh, missile uh, in each uh, and every uh, silo uh, built. But the silo-based ICBM is just part of the picture because China is actually implementing a very comprehensive uh, nuclear uh, modernization program. Uh, it is, uh, in addition to ICBM silos, it is also expanding its road mobile ICBM forces. Um, it is uh, expanding its uh, sea-based nuclear capabilities and it's also adding an air lag into its uh, nuclear triad uh, capability by the time, uh, by the way, uh, traditionally, you know, China was very critical of the term nuclear triad. It used to criticize the US and Soviet Union slash Russia for uh, developing and maintaining nuclear triad capability as a symbol of uh, nuclear uh, hegemonism. But now China itself is openly uh, talking about its own nuclear triad capability. Um, you know, um, the most, you know, last year the U.S. defense uh, and intel community uh, assessed that uh, uh, in, uh, by 2027, China might uh, develop up to 700 nuclear warheads. And by the end of this decade, 2030, China may have at least 1,000 nuclear weapons. Um, so if you look at the change in numbers, that's a very significant change. And there is also very important change in the official narratives. For many years, the Chinese official narrative when talking about nuclear capabilities is that China uh, maintains a lean and effective uh, nuclear force. Uh, but uh, in 2021, during the you know, uh, two sessions, the most important political uh, conferences in China, uh, the official um, talking point became that China will accelerate the construction of high-level strategic deterrent system. And uh, in, 20, uh, in this year, 2020, uh, during the recently concluded uh, 20th Party Congress, the, national, the official narrative uh, becomes that China uh, will develop a powerful uh, strategic deterrent capability system. Uh, I think um, you know, the, the change in narrative is also very um, obvious. So why China is uh, you know, changing its nuclear uh, capability, um, the most uh, you know, um, widely discussed uh, reasons um, uh, are that uh, China uh, has been worried about uh, American uh, technical uh, uh, capabilities uh, in both the nuclear uh, field but also non-nuclear uh, field. Uh, the US has been uh, improving a wide range of non-nuclear strategic capabilities that could, in one way or another, undermine the overall survivability and credibility of Chinese second strike capability, and that includes missile defense, conventional precision strike weapons, uh, you know, space-based sensors that can more accurately and timely uh, detect, track, and trail Chinese nuclear weapon platforms in the ocean or on the land. Um, uh, you know, even uh, uh, cyber technologies could be used uh, to per potentially, uh, uh, inter uh, you know, undermine Chinese capability to uh, launch uh, its nuclear weapons in a retaliation. Uh, and among all these uh, technologies, missile defense is uh, obviously uh, the most concerning uh, to China. And China, you know, uses worst case scenario thinking when uh, evaluating the impact of missile defense because China always assumes that the U.S. will launch a comprehensive uh, disarming strike first using perhaps not only nuclear but also uh, conventional uh, strike capabilities to destroy as many Chinese nuclear weapons as possible and therefore only a small number of Chinese nuclear weapons would survive a preemptive first strike and therefore even a limited scale uh, um, U.S. homeland missile defense could potentially uh, intercept uh, the uh, survived Chinese nuclear weapons and therefore undermining uh, the overall credibility. Um, and of course, China is also worried about the recent trend in the United States about uh, using a theater range uh, missile defense systems like uh, standard missile three uh, to work as under a layer of the homeland missile defense uh, system. Um, 
you know, there was a dispute in 2016 about the U.S. deployment of the SAD uh, missile defense system, even though that's, uh, you know, a theater range system uh, even less capable than the SM-3 system. There was a huge debate about the uh, real capacity of the radar, uh, the ANTPI-2 uh, radar of the SAD system, whether that could uh, distinguish uh, Chinese warheads from decoys and therefore significantly improve the efficiency of U.S. homeland missile defense. Um, so all of these concerns are, are very real. Um, and then after the demise of the INF Treaty in 2019, there is growing Chinese concern about U.S. deployment or forward deployment of uh, precision conventional uh, missiles uh, uh, in places near China that could potentially uh, threaten Chinese nuclear systems. So facing all these uh, uh, new technological developments, um, and many of the technologies are invisible. Um, um, and how, how do the two countries agree on the degree of the impact of all these new technologies on the survivability of Chinese nuclear weapons uh, and therefore be able to maintain a general, uh, a basic nuclear balance um, mm -hmm. between the two sides. Uh, that's a real challenge. Uh, and of course, uh, there is also the impact from third party players like North Korea, uh, because you know the two countries, uh, North Korea and China, are so closely uh, located. Uh, North Korean ICBMs that target the American homeland would fly a very similar trajectory as Chinese, and many of Chinese ICBMs that target American homeland. Uh, and therefore, American homeland missile defense system that can intercept North Korean ICBMs would have some capability um, to, inter to uh, you know, affect Chinese ICBMs. So how do we you know, um, potentially uh, address this entanglement of Chinese and DPRK uh, capabilities uh, and um, um, so that American missile defense could only affect uh, North Korea without affecting China? Um, that's also a, a challenge presented by technology and geography. So these are all technical level uh, drivers, which I think are real. You know, I, a couple of years ago, I wrote a report uh, to discuss uh, the real Chinese concern about U.S. missile defense and how that affects Chinese nuclear thinking. However, I don't think these technical level explanations uh, you know, fully explain um, the current run of Chinese nuclear buildup because firstly, um, there is no, you know, if you think that um, China is mostly uh, worried about U.S. missile defense uh, and, you know, increasing American nuclear uh, preempt preemptive strike capabilities and therefore China needs to build up. But on the American side, there is no abrupt and, uh, you know, uh, substantial improvement of either nuclear or missile defense capability. The U.S. has been incrementally improving those capabilities, but there is nothing uh, abrupt and nothing, you know, uh, substantial. Um, but how, so that cannot explain the rather obs uh, uh, abrupt and, and rather uh, massive uh, increase of Chinese nuclear arsenal. And secondly, um, if, you know, I do believe uh, among all the technical level factors, American homeland missile defense is the uh, greatest Chinese concern. But then if you look at the silos, Right, which is the most important part of China's current nuclear buildup, silo-based ICBMs are not really ideal uh, for addressing missile defense concerns. It's not the most cost-effective manner uh, to address missile defense concern. Um, so that doesn't help explain um, the, the buildup. Um, and thirdly, if you, you know, uh, uh, read Chinese, uh, writings by Chinese uh, civilian and military experts, uh, they don't appear uh, uh, be aware uh, of the Chinese uh, buildup until uh, you know the silo sites were reviewed by international analysts using uh, commercially available satellite image, and you know even uh, senior military experts, um, you know who, uh, you know is perhaps the most uh, uh, one of the most prominent uh, Chinese military experts on nuclear issues, on strategic security issues. Uh, and, and th this, this expert wrote uh, and published a, rep uh, a book on, uh, on China's nuclear policy, on U.S.-China nuclear relationship uh, very recently. And because the draft of the book was written before the revelation of Chinese silo sites, and in the book, the expert never 
uh, mentioned a need for China to massively uh, build up its nuclear force. Actually, the expert recommended very explicitly in the book that China should continue its incremental um, approach of nuclear modernization. So it looks like even the experts themselves um, were not aware of uh, the buildup in a large part. And after the revelation of the buildup, many of them do not still, uh, uh, many of them still do not appear to understand what's the real military rationale uh, that would be, uh, you know, um, that would justify uh, this buildup. Um, and lastly, when uh, Chinese officials were posed uh, about, uh, uh, were posed the question about why China is building up, they didn't really talk about American missile defense threats uh, or you know, new American nuclear capabilities. They were talking about the need to increase the safety and the security of their nuclear arsenal. If the buildup is really driven by growing concern about US missile defense, I think Chinese officials would have every reason, every incentive to openly criticize and point it out the American missile defense program as you know, the reason that China needs to respond to. Uh, so I tend to believe that it is actually political level uh, drivers that uh, are primarily um, behind the recent nuclear buildup. Uh, we tend to focus, you know, for a long time, we tend to focus on the military rationale behind China's nuclear program. We talk about the Chinese need to maintain a credible second strike capability, uh, et cetera, which is true. But from day one of China's nuclear program, um, the political value of nuclear weapons uh, has always been uh, very important. Um, you know, Mao Zedong uh, said very early on that uh, you know, imperialist countries would look down upon us uh, because we don't have atomic bombs uh, and only have grenades. And therefore, China should have atomic bombs and develop hydrogen bombs as soon as possible. And Deng Xiaoping, uh, who said, uh, if China had not had atomic and hydrogen bombs and launched satellites, since the 1960s, it would not have been able to be called a major power with significant influence and would not have had the international status as it has now. And Deng also pointed out if China was to have a higher status uh, and more say in the future world order, it must be backed by a strong nuclear power. Jiang Zemin uh, said that China needs to strive to build a lean and e effective strategic nuclear force commensurate with China's great power status. And Hu Jintao said something very similar. China needs to build a strategic missile force commensurate with China's great power status. And Xi Jinping, in particular, um, in 2012, said you know, nuclear weapons' fundamental nature as a political weapon won't change. Um, nuclear forces' uh, strategic role in political, diplomatic, and military struggles won't change. Uh, the deterring effect of nuclear weapons is absolute and cannot be replaced by other armed capabilities, and therefore we must fully understand the strategic cornerstone role of nuclear forces. I think here, um, uh, Xi, uh, uh, Xi Jinping's thinking about nuclear weapons is actually a continuation of previous Chinese paramount leaders in the sense that he wants to build a nuclear force that is commensurate with China's major power status. However, what is different today is what does China's major power status mean today appears to be very different from before. And I think the current uh, political uh, leaders in China, especially the paramount leader, Mr. Xi, uh, he has an interesting, uh, they have an interesting interpretation uh, about today's geopolitical landscape. They certainly are aware that there are growing geopolitical tensions between China and the US-led Western countries, but they attribute all these growing troubles uh, to the structural change in the international balance of power. Uh, they attribute all the problems to the power transition process between China and the US-led Western countries. They think that uh, for a long time, you know, the power gap between China and US-led Western countries was still large, and therefore the Western countries, they were comfortable with China's you know, gradual development. But when China uh, is able to you know, narrow that power gap and when China becomes closer and closer to you know, achieve that power transition, uh, 
that's when the Western countries would become much more uh, worried and much more desperate to resort to extreme measures in order to slow down China's growth, to contain China, to make sure that you know, China wouldn't be able to continue this, this path of challenging uh, the Western countries' predominance in the international system. Um, they think the reason the Western countries are increasingly criticizing China on issues of human rights, domestic suppression, uh, Uyghurs, re-education re campaign in China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, it's not because the Western countries really care about these issues or human rights or political freedom in China. It's because the Western countries, in order to advance their selfish geopolitical interests, they use these issues as excuses uh, to make trouble for China, to make China harder to continue its rise. So that's their understanding of what is driving uh, the tensions. And because they, uh, in, uh, in addition to that, a secondary uh, uh, you know, popular thinking in China is the Western countries' uh, you know, strategic culture is different from China's you know, harmonious culture. The Western culture is by nature uh, hegemonic, uh, and that's hard to change. So for these two reasons, but primarily for the reason of the, you know, uh, the power transition process, they think you know, the only way to resolve the problem is actually to further accelerate the power transition process. By the time China can build and demonstrate a formidable power, especially strategic power, that's when the US-led Western countries would eventually have to acknowledge the new reality of a recent China, and they would have to eventually deal with China with equality and respect. So it is driven, by, driven primarily by this power-centric mindset that they believe it's the structural change in the international system that's causing all these problems, and therefore the solution has to be at the structural uh, 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 level, and therefore to further focus on building power. And they always talk about Russia, right? Uh, having a equal nuclear power with the United States, uh, being treated by Western countries with much more carefulness, with much more prudence, uh, despite you know, Russia causing troubles at various places. And therefore, um, you know, even Xi, he, he, he said, you know, Russia would rather tighten its belt and do nothing else in order to hold on to this matter of, of nuclear uh, uh, capability. Um, and um, so in order to you know, further uh, uh, accelerate the power transition process, you know, Xi uh, is very, uh, uh, you know, attaches great importance to uh, comprehensive military buildup and, and you know, nuclear, which is regarded as a strategic uh, military capability. It's a very important part of this picture in order to change Western countries' perception about the power balance. Um, and she gave you know, very interesting and very specific uh, instructions to uh, uh, Chinese military officials about nuclear development, uh, instructions that were much more specific, at least in, in openly available domain, much more specific than previous Chinese leaders. Uh, basically, he upgraded the second artillery from uh, a military uh, a branch to a full military service uh, in 2015. He ordered the, PLA, the newly established PLA Iraqi force to expedite the pace of development in 2016. He instructed the PLA uh, Navy officials that our sea-based nuclear capabilities need to massively develop uh, in, in a village uh, to a naval base in 2018. Um, and he started to talk about the role of strategic balancing as a mission uh, for China's uh, missile uh, forces, uh, which I think is something new, and I think by uh, uh, you know, talking about strategic balancing, he's um, referring to this overall strategic and political uh, role of nuclear weapons um, in affecting foreign countries' perception of uh, um, the balance of power. Um, and the, I think one reason you know, China uh, focuses so much on silo-based ICBMs early on in this round of buildup is because that's the fastest way that China can really expand and demonstrate a much larger nuclear, a much greater nuclear capability because of China's unique uh, advantage in uh, building large-scale uh, infrastructure uh, at you know, uh, relatively low cost. Um, and actually Mao, uh, 
1964, when uh, at that time, before China uh, conducted its first nuclear uh, test, Mao was uh, uh, presented with two options. Uh, one is to uh, detonate uh, China's first nuclear device early. Uh, the second option is to do that later uh, and use the time to better uh, uh, weaponize the device to better develop delivery system because once you reveal to the world that you have a nuclear capability, you become vulnerable before you can fully weaponize the program and you can actually develop the missile system that can uh, you know, be, uh, uh, give you the real capacity to, to launch a nuclear weapon. Uh, so technically speaking, the second option is better for Chinese security. Um, but Mao basically said, uh, no, the, the role of nuclear weapons is to scare our adversaries, right? It's, it's, it's the political role that is more important. So he chose the early test option uh, because of this. And this uh, story was also told in um, Dr. Hui Zhang's research, who is a um, Harvard-based uh, scholar uh, in his new manual uh, script on Chinese nuclear weapon uh, program history, which uh, I hope will be published soon. Um, and given this top leadership's uh, view about the importance of, about the political importance of nuclear weapons, um, and given that China has uh, increasingly centralized uh, decision-making system uh, domestically, um, you know, the people uh, at the operational level uh, you know, they can very efficiently implement the top leadership's vision um, um, to expand China's nuclear capability. Um, but in addition to that, uh, I, I think we also need to be aware that um, when the military is, is presented with the political mandate to expand the nuclear capability, they also need to uh, you know, develop a more specific thinking about what capabilities specifically uh, they need to, they want to develop. Uh, and here, I think um, China's military, at the military level, they are increasingly interested in uh, crisis management capability. And this differs uh, from China's traditional nuclear thinking. Uh, traditionally, you know, Ch China is believed to rely on uh, a relatively simple um, strategy of massive retaliation uh, to deter nuclear attack, which basically means uh, whatever uh, type of nuclear uh, attack China was um, subject to, China would uh, launch a massive retaliation against the homeland of the enemy. Um, uh, and actually, Professor Fravo and um, another scholar, um, uh, Cunningham, uh, you know, wrote a very important international security article uh, which very well explains these traditional Chinese views about nuclear escalation, which is uh, it's very hard uh, to uh, escalate a conventional war beyond the nuclear level. The risk of a conventional war escalating to the nuclear level is very small because powers, they understand the risk of going nuclear. So despite their rhetorics, in reality, you know, they would rarely uh, really uh, escalate beyond the nuclear threshold. Um, so that's why, you know, for a long time, China was not that worried about, um, you know, real military threat. Uh, and it, it thought that a massive retaliation capability um, was more than enough to deter uh, nuclear uh, threats of all types. Um, but once a conventional war escalates beyond the nuclear level, the traditional Chinese thinking is, it is really hard to control escalation. Yeah? And it's really hard to manage escalation. It will very likely quickly escalate all the way to an all-out nuclear exchange. And because of this, this traditional uh, thinking about uh, nuclear escalation, China, Chinese strategists paid uh, you know, less attention to how to manage nuclear escalation from a low-level nuclear war to a you know, higher-level nuclear war. It, 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 attention was mostly focused on how to prevent a conventional war from ever escalating across nuclear thresholds. However, you know, Chinese military strategy, they also recognized very early on uh, in the 1980s that there is a potential vulnerability uh, in Chinese nuclear capability and nuclear posture, which is the massive retaliation capability and posture may be very effective uh, in deterring a uh, you know, large-scale nuclear attack. Uh, but if the enemy uh, launches or threatens a limited uh, nuclear attack, 
uh, China you know, wouldn't be able to respond uh, appropriately. Um, if you threaten you know, massive retaliation, you know, it's just a too risky uh, uh, decision. Uh, it's too escalatory. It's not really credible. Um, but because at that time, the China-US security relationship was relatively good, and China-Soviet relationship was improving, so I think the Chinese uh, didn't uh, feel the pressure to really invest resources to address this already identified uh, vulnerability uh, in their capability and posture. But in recent years, I think the situation has uh, changed, uh, including the you know, increasing uh, realistic threat, uh, uh, risk of a military conflict over Taiwan uh, with the United States. Um, and here, uh, of course, the growing Chinese conventional military uh, capability at the theater level means that China has, should have even less incentive to uh, threaten uh, limited uh, nuclear first use uh, because of its growing conventional uh, advantage. Uh, but the Chinese concern here is the U.S. also understands very well that it's losing its traditional conventional superiority. And therefore, there is a growing risk that the U.S. might lose a theater conventional war with China, and the U.S. may have a growing need to threaten uh, limited uh, nuclear use or to threaten nuclear escalation, basically. Uh, so as a result, China may have to uh, think more seriously about how to deter a limited uh, nuclear, uh, American nuclear threat. Um, so perhaps that's why you know, we have seen China uh, investing um, into its uh, theater nuclear forces with very accu accurate missile system uh, developed and deployed um, so that China can have the capability to respond in kind or to respond in proportion. Uh, to limited nuclear threats in order to deter them from being launched in the first place. Um, you know, there was this reported Chinese testing of, uh, of an orbital hypersonic missile system last year. You know, of course, it's, you know, up, to, you know, it's, it's, it's up to debate about whether China is, is uh, you know, what specific military goal that type of uh, system might uh, provide of course, we don't know if China is going to, uh, you know, really aiming at deploying an orbital uh, hypersonic missile system. At least it appears that China wants to have the capability uh, of uh, long range or maybe even intercontinental range uh, hypersonic missile. But what's the purpose of this missile system? One, you know, possible uh, application, I think, is that it can very well uh, work as uh, escalation management uh, capability because once a nuclear war escalates further beyond original level limited nuclear exchange, the next level is limited exchange at the intercontinental range. Right? If the U.S. further launches a small number of ICBMs uh, against China, China may want to be able to launch uh, also a small number of intercontinental range nuclear systems against the U.S. homeland. But because the U.S. has a missile defense system that may not be able to intercept a large-scale Chinese nuclear retaliation, but may have a you know, reasonable chance of intercepting a limited Chinese intercontinental nuclear retaliation. But if China has highly penetrating intercontinental nuclear system like a hypersonic missile, that could give China this opportunity to respond in kind without worrying about the impact on American homeland missile defense. But that's just you know, one, you know, my uh, speculation about one of the possible military rationales of this capability. Um, if we look at uh, the, uh, the Chinese military rhetoric, uh, it appears that uh, the line uh, between nuclear deterrence and nuclear war fighting becomes uh, blurrier in recent years. Um, since the 2019 uh, Chinese military parade, uh, China starts to use uh, um, three new terms to describe the mission of Chinese uh, nuclear forces, uh, which is uh, uh, strategic balancing, uh, strategic deterrent and control, and strategic decisive victory. Right? That strategic decisive victory you know, to be used to describe the role of nuclear forces is something new. And, is certainly up to interpretation. 
And this, these uh, terms are you know, repeatedly used in, in following years. So it's clearly it's, it's official um, um, terminology now uh, within the rocket force. Um, and generally speaking, when it comes to uh, military development, uh, Mr. Xi has been emphasizing the importance of the actual capability to fight and win wars, right? Uh, he says, uh, you know, only when you can fight can you stop fighting. And he seems to believe that um, if your deterrence needs to be, and if, if you want to have a credible deterrence, you actually need to demonstrate the capability to actually fight and win. Um, and again, overall, uh, he uh, stresses the importance of preparing for war. You know, that's a major uh, 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 instruction from him in recent years. And perhaps the PLE rocket force, like other military branches, they also want to demonstrate political loyalty uh, to show that they are you know, faithfully implementing Mr. Xi's instruction on war fighting, preparing for war. Uh, so they, they want to more, uh, uh, better incorporate the idea of war fighting into their specific area and specific mission. Um, so increasingly, they emphasize on the rapid response capability of, of uh, missile forces. Again, strategic decisive victory is often talked about. Uh, they openly uh, describe their DF-26 missile units as nuclear conventional dual capable missile units that uh, can carry out full domain deterrence and war fighting. Um, so now when, when they you know, put nuclear and conventional capabilities together and talk about war fighting, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, somewhat different from their previous uh, narrative, which has been careful in separating the mission of conventional uh, missile forces and nuclear missile forces, that, that they didn't, you know, um, uh, talk about the role of war fighting uh, when referring to uh, nuclear uh, missile forces. Uh, they also emphasize the importance of combat readiness duty, and, and he is even putting a small number of uh, both conventional and nuclear missile forces on combat readiness. Uh, uh, duty uh, during peacetime. The thing is, if this is driven indeed by this you know, effort to please the top leadership to fulfill his uh, political mandate, you know, to implement his preparing for war instruction uh, by the rocket force, so the question is, do the rocket force officials fully understand the operational implications of talking, increasingly talking about war fighting and decisive victory for their nuclear forces. Um, I think that's, you know, that's a question we don't have answers to. But one implication of that is, I think, at least they are giving more thoughts to uh, developing uh, escalation management capabilities as they envision an increasing uh, real risk of military conflict with the United States. And they increasingly worry the United States is you know, deliberately trying to lower the nuclear threshold by developing low yield nuclear weapons, uh, et cetera. So the, the third perception about the United States uh, changing nuclear posture may be also driving this uh, Chinese interest in escalation management capability. And the thing is, traditionally for many decades, China, you know, relied on massive retaliation and was only focused on building a secure second strike capability at the intercontinental level for nuclear deterrent. But now if it's shifting towards you know, managing escalation, you know, that's a very different um, um, type of, uh, set of uh, military requirement for its nuclear forces. Uh, especially if both US and China today are pursuing uh, crisis man management capabilities. You know that's much harder. That's a nuclear equation that is much harder to to contain. That's mu that's a competition that is much harder to um, to manage. Uh, so I think that if that's indeed what China is doing, it could you know put the U.S.-China nuclear relationship in a very different uh, paradigm than before. 
So again, um, escalation management uh, is increasingly desirable to the Chinese military. Uh, but that, you know, that doesn't you know, explain the full picture of China's current buildup because, again, uh, the most important and most relevant uh, capabilities for managing nuclear escalation is actually at the theater level, right? Because China is mostly worried about the U.S. Uh, uh, limited theater range nuclear uh, threats, especially involving low-yield nuclear weapons. Um, but if you look at China's current buildup, the ICBM silos that's apparently at the intercontinental range level, uh, that doesn't directly contribute uh, to the escalation management capability. So still, you know, despite this military desire for escalation management, I still think overall the buildup is mostly driven by uh, a top-down political mandate to, demonst to demonstrate stronger uh, strategic military capability. Um, and when the military and the defense industry, they receive this political mandate from, from top level, uh, and they are you know, um, showered with resources, um, they have no incentive to, uh, you know, um, to make hard choices. Right? They, ca they can afford to you know, develop different types of capabilities as they, as they desire. And, and uh, you know, there, you know, especially when Mr. Xi himself has talked about the importance of developing uh, anti-satellite capabilities, uh, missile defense capabilities, um, especially when uh, the PLA strategists believe that um, uh, launch on warning posture may be beneficial for China, crisis management capability may be increasingly useful. They may just, you know, um, try to develop all these capabilities all together. Um, and again, as I said, many military and civilian experts appear to have been excluded from internal nuclear uh, policy deliberation and, and making. Um, whereas on the military and on the military uh, side of the equation, you have more stakeholders in the nuclear business. You have rocket force, you have air force, you have navy that are all part of the nuclear um, uh, state, you know, uh, nuclear, uh, they are all nuclear stakeholders. They all want to strengthen their uh, part of the nuclear uh, cake. So there are more stakeholders, uh, you know, uh, wanting, to, wanting to have more resources. And there's very little domestic checks and balances. You know, there's very little scrutiny from the media, from uh, research community, from the general public. The general public uh, are not even aware of, of what China is doing regarding its nuclear capability because of you know, lack of uh, information and transparency. Uh, so in this process, in this uh, in domestic uh, uh, process, when you have increasingly strong uh, promoters of nuclear capabilities, but very little checks and balances, I think you know, nuclear expansion is you know, very likely to happen. Um, that said, uh, it appears that at the top level, the senior Chinese leaders are still committed to asymmetric deterrent. Right? There is no clear desire for achieving nuclear parity with the United States or Russia. Uh, Mr. Xi himself uh, seemed to have said in 2012, when talking about China's, nuclear, uh, China's missile forces, he said, you know, we must increasingly enhance our asymmetric strategic balancing capability against a powerful enemy, meaning the United States. And uh, you know, the, deputy, um, of the, uh, the, the deputy chair of the Central Military Commission, Xu Qiliang, said recently, and I think Mr. Xi also said this uh, many years, uh, uh, 10 years ago, that we will insist on asymmetric balancing and uh, selective development uh, of strategic capabilities. Uh, um, I think that's, that means at least at the top level, they still don't see a value to achieve nuclear parity. Um, uh, they are likely to be taking an incremental step-by-step -step type of decision making. They you know, expand and they re-evaluate the security environment and then make a decision for the next step. Uh, step. Uh, but the thing is, 
Yes, from the Chinese perspective, its nuclear expansion is completely self-defensive. Right? Its goal is to contain the perceived American political and strategic hostility against China. Um, but because of their expectation that after China acquires a larger nuclear capability, that would somehow contain the American political and strategic hostility. But I'm afraid that the result would be the opposite. Right? The US and other Western countries, they would be very concerned about this seemingly unlimited and non-transparent Chinese nuclear buildup. And that could you know, uh, uh, further worsen uh, the bilateral security relationship and even the overall strategic relationship. So by the time China, for example, in 2030, uh, acquires an arsenal of 1,000 nuclear warheads, I don't think US-China relationship would you know, improve. It perhaps it would become worse. You know, there will be greater concern about Chinese nuclear uh, development. But faced with this new reality of a worsened uh, relationship or a uh, worsened security environment, I don't think the Chinese leadership is going to say, okay, we made a mistake. We shouldn't have built up our nuclear forces. I think they're going to draw the, you know, the opposite conclusion. They're going to say, well, we haven't built up, built up enough right? with more nuclear weapons. Maybe the Western countries would eventually acknowledge our, you know, uh, our power uh, and recognize and accept the, the new reality. So even though the initial uh, intent is, is self-defensive, I'm afraid it could very well lead to uh, you know, an uncontrollable uh, nuclear arms race uh, between the two sides. And clearly, because of this power-centric mindset behind the nuclear buildup, there is little interest at the political level to engage in anything uh, about arms control because the overall consensus is it is time now for China to focus on building up our power. It's not the time to think about limiting our power potential. Uh, the thing is, does the United States understand and appreciate the political nature of the Chinese nuclear buildup? I'm afraid the American uh, policy community is too preoccupied um, at the military level uh, rationale, and they try to understand what's the specific, a specific military objective China tries to achieve with a larger nuclear arsenal. I'm afraid that's misplaced. Um, and if the U.S. doesn't fully understand the political nature of the buildup, they could very well, um, you know, decide to uh, further uh, enhance American strategic capability to counter uh, this Chinese buildup. And that would further exacerbate Chinese paranoia and reinforce the Chinese belief that greater uh, nuclear capability is necessary. Uh, so I think a better understanding of the you know, political uh, thinking is uh, useful. So lastly, uh, let me quickly offer a few thoughts to uh, manage uh, this uh, situation. Um, again, given the political nature, uh, I tend to believe you know, uh, it will be uh, necessary uh, for the US to be more open to start a broad political dialogue with China. The increasingly clear signal from Chinese officials is that we don't want to talk about nuclear weapons. We don't want to talk about strategic stability issues with you, which is very different from before. Right? The, previously, China was very interested in discussing strategic stability with the United States. The China was seeking reassurance from the United States on nuclear issues. But today, I think China has moved on. China has decided to rely on its unilateral capacity to maintain you know, a credible deterrent on the nuclear um, issue. And no is no longer seeking reassurance uh, from the United States. Um, and the inc increasing uh, signal from the Chinese uh, senior leadership is that you know, we don't want to talk about these issues unless the US is willing to first address China's you know, most important political concerns, like you know, not to challenge you know, CCP's role in China, not to challenge 
China's domestic political system, not to cha challenge China on uh, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, Taiwan issues, etc. Um, and you know, I th that's the most, uh, you know, uh, that's the biggest obstacle today. Um, you know, I don't think the U.S. needs to. Uh, you know, I don't think the U.S. necessarily needs to make any concessions on those political issues. But I think there is a need for the U.S. to show a willingness to have a broad political discussion on those pressing uh, political issues, because eventually, right, nuclear buildup is a result, is a symptom of the growing political um, disagreement and political disputes between the two sides. And if we really want to tackle the nuclear escalation, we have to tackle their growing political uh, disagreement. And there are many things uh, on those uh, controversial political issues that U.S. can talk with China without making immediate concessions. Right? There are many things, there are many misunderstandings about American policy, American thinking. Uh, so if U.S. starts a broad political dialogue, it might actually help better cl clarify American thinking and uh, stabilize the relationship at the political level, which will pave the ground for more effective nuclear and strategic stability discussions. And then at the military and the nuclear level, uh, I think perhaps the U.S. could be more uh, open to engage with China on topics that are favored by China. Right. China really you know, has insisted that if you want to talk about nuclear weapons, let's talk about no first use. Right. That's the most uh, uh, useful way to contain a nuclear arms race. That's the most useful way to reduce the role of nuclear weapons in national security uh, strategy. Um, that's the most useful way to reduce nuclear risk. Um, the U.S. has been reluctant to, to talk, um, but I think uh, it shouldn't. Um, because apparently when uh, Mr. Biden uh, was campaigning uh, for president, there, is, uh, you know, there appears some possibility that um, the Biden administration might um, be willing to consider no first use or sole purpose policy. And if you read the Chinese reaction at that time, it is clear that China does not, that China would not trust American no first use policy, even if the U.S. adopts a no first use policy officially. Same American suspicion about the credibility of no first use. So the U.S. can you know, very well start a discussion about how do we measure, how do we understand the credibility of, nuclear, of no first use? What are the you know, specific criteria we can use to understand each other's credibility? What specific capabilities might not um, be uh, uh, consistent with no first use? What you know, nuclear posture might not be? Let's have a you know, discussion about that and you know, try to build some common standings which is very necessary if the two sides really wants to use a, a mutual no first agreement to uh, uh, reassure each other. So there are many things the U.S. can talk about China, even on the issue of no first use, that can benefit American interests. And after Ukraine war, of course, the no first use becomes even more controversial because what Russia demonstrated during the Ukraine war is that it didn't need to explicitly threaten nuclear use against a specific country in order to acquire coercive benefit. Right? It can issue veiled or, or implicit nuclear threat and still achieve some benefit. Um, and I think you know, that makes the definition of the threat of nuclear use even less clear. And all these issues need to be discussed between US and China if they want to provide credible no first use uh, uh, reassurance to each other because the Chinese no first use policy doesn't include a promise not to threaten nuclear use, uh, nuclear first use in conventional war. It only promises no nuclear use. It doesn't promise no threat of nuclear use. So there are many you know, specific issues they can discuss. And of course, there are many you know, misunderstandings uh, about each other's policy. Um, as I mentioned before, perhaps uh, the two sides experts can uh, 
sit down together and jointly look at the technical possibility for the United States to design and build a homeland missile defense system that can only deal with North Korea's ICBM without undermining Chinese ICBM, right? Is that technically feasible, right? They need to answer, you know, answer that question first before they can address their, their political uh, and policy disagreements. Uh, you know, they also had this major dispute about that in 2016. Even today, the experts from the two sides never sat down together to try to understand what's the technical disagreement um, that you know, uh, underline their you know, political disagreement over this issue. And what's you know, specific technical issue that the two sides disagree about the radar system of the SAD that lead them to draw very different conclusions about the capability and the implications of this small, of this single uh, radar system. And that type of technical discussion can happen at unclassified level by relying on publicly available information uh, because a number of independent research has demonstrated the possibility. Um, they can you know, uh, jointly examine specific uh, confidence building measures, arms control proposals. Uh, many think tanks, uh, experts have suggest, you know, come, come up with specific arms control and confidence building measures um, the thing is, those measures have not been seriously discussed together uh, by the two sides, and China has not really uh, come to the, uh, the uh, uh, recognition that those measures can indeed help uh, protect China's uh, security interests. And I think some joint examination of those specific proposals could help uh, increase Chinese appreciation of the value of those proposals and therefore make them more likely to be picked up by the government. Um, risk reduction measures uh, is you know, very much stressed by the US government, including the recent nuclear posture review. Uh, it is viewed as a you know, most uh, realistic area of near-term cooperation. Uh, but the two sides disagree about who causes uh, nuclear risks. Um, so. I think it would be useful to uh, discuss firstly their respective views about the sources of military and the nuclear risks. That's a topic that Chinese officials have indicated interest in discussing. Um, and the US and China can use that discussion to build better mutual understanding about each other's nuclear powers and thinking. Uh, so perhaps these measures would help provide some limited uh, capacity on both sides to manage, to better manage their nuclear relationship and slow down their current uh, trajectory towards uh, more dangerous nuclear escalation. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. The floor is open. Um, all right, I see Barry up first. Everyone else, keep your hand up. Barry, you get the first question. All right. So I'm trying to come back to um, what I thought I heard you say about the um, concerns that President Xi has that the Americans see the dynamism of China's growth as power and may be tempted to try and do something about it. I thought I heard you say that that was the fundamental fear, right? that they're afraid that the Americans will try and do something about China's rise and that therefore some immediate action is necessary. So I'm trying to figure out what they imagine the Americans might do. I mean, do they actually have a theory that the U.S. is looking for opportunities for preventive war and that somehow they need a, 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 a really good lever that they can get really quickly to neutralize that perception, to neutralize that thinking. So 
that the, somehow there's some magical quality that three or four hundred silos have that will quickly neutralize the U.S. preventive war incentive. Right? Now, I might be able to draw myself a nuclear strategy story of, of how this works, and I don't think you, that was your instinct. I think your instinct was to say that there's some political story and certainly in the backdrop of China's thinking about nuclear weapons, that's there. But it's not obvious how that answers the mail for a fear of American preventive war incentives. So tell me if I have it right that you think that they think that the Americans are contemplating preventive war. And if so, how does this nuclear modernization so quickly answer the mail that it neutralizes the ins American incentive for preventive war rather than making it more intense? Well, I'm, I'm not saying that China uh, is deeply worried about American preventive war. Um, I think uh, from the Chinese perspective, the U.S. is already using all means possible to uh, create troubles for China, to slow down China's <coughs> growth. China, in, you know, uh, from the Chinese interpretation, the American criticism on China about Uyghurs, about uh, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, Taiwan, about China's domestic uh, political suppression, is all about this overall effort to, to create trouble for China, to make China look bad, to make China less capable to uh, win international uh, support, uh, to you know, undermine China's international image. Um, um, and, and as a result, um, somehow China needs to convince the United States that uh, this is all futile. Um, and to demonstrate stronger, comprehensive national power is the answer to change the American strategic perspective, to make the U.S. accept reality. Right? And nuclear is only a small part of this uh, solution. I'm not saying China seeks to use nuclear expansion to resolve this bigger mission of changing Western perception. But nuclear is an important part because um, you know, part of demonstrating greater comprehensive national power is, of course, about economic development, about technological development, but also about military development. I think that's, from day one, a very important uh, incentive for Mr. Xi to you know, uh, talk about the dream of a strong army. Uh, to comprehensively engage, uh, invest in uh, military modernization. And within the military, uh, nuclear is the most important part is, you know, its strategic capability. It, it, views, it is viewed as having the most direct psychological impact on Chinese adversaries. Uh, so I, knew, I think nuclear is part of this overall effort to demonstrate greater strategic power and therefore to convince the U.S. and Western countries, you know, don't, don't try to resort to extreme measures to contain China. You, you just accept China's, you know, just accept peaceful co coexistence with China. Don't try to slow down China's right. Don't try to destabilize China. Don't try to overthrow China's political system. This is already reality. We are already there. We have the capability that would make you accept the new reality. And nuclear, I think, is part of this thinking. And in terms of uh, uh, military, uh, I do think there is the Chinese concern that as China further narrows the power gap, the US will become more desperate and will use more extreme measures to you know, contain China. And the, you know, there's a growing risk. The US might deliberately provoke some limited military conflict uh, to destabilize the situation if necessary. 
And that's why I think, you know, one of the examples is uh, in the run up to the American presidential election uh, during the end of the Trump administration, the US, the, the Chinese military, the Ch and also the Chinese political leadership appear to genuinely believe that the US military might deliberately provoke some conflict, perhaps in the South China Sea or you know, another place near China. Um, and to the extent that the US is really worried about this Chinese misperception that you know, American senior leader, military leaders called uh, their Chinese counterparts two, two times, if I remember correctly, to you know, clarify the U.S. intent, you know, there's no interest in deliberately provoking tensions, you know, don't, don't, don't overreact. Uh, um, so I, think, I don't think China thinks the U.S. is going to launch a preemptive war to you know, disarm China, but I think there is growing worry and genuine worry that you know, there, will, there will be increasing U.S. attempts to exploit the risk of military tensions in order uh, you know, to create trouble for China, to destabilize, de destabilize the situation, especially near Chinese, uh, you know, at the Chinese doorstep, um, basically you know, make it harder for China to concentrate on you know, domestic development uh, so that it will take longer time for China to, to uh, catch up. So my question is in some ways kind of more nuclear version of, of Barry's question and, and kind of what the nuclear capability and modernization of, of doctrine may be a remedy to. Um, and so in particular, you mentioned there's concern that as the, the conventional balance increasingly favors China, uh, that they're worried the United States may use a theater nuclear weapon, presumably either for kind of a coercive escalate to de-escalate style strategy or as part of tactical nuclear use. This, this first came on the, the radar in the 2021 U.S.-China military power report that said that the Chinese defense community became increasingly concerned the U.S. would use tactical nuclear weapons against an amphibious uh, fleet, uh, which is presumably about six months after the, the, the Bridge Colby, a former uh, DASD working on nuclear issues, proposed that in foreign affairs. So I'm curious to learn more about um, what you've seen as concerns about this specific scenario of, of uh, U.S. kind of nuclear war fighting at the tactical level and how these things like silos speak to that, right? Is this really is the DF-26 is the remedy to that? It's not about the silos of, of how, do, how do the Chinese view this concern that's a minority view in the U.S. defense community at this point that there'll be tactical nuclear use and that's viable for us. And how do their responses kind of fit into that concern? Yeah, um, I think, yes, there is growing concern about U.S. Um, uh, you know, interest in threatening limited uh, nuclear use in a conventional war. Um, you know, Bridge Kobe's writings, I think, um, may uh, have contributed uh, to some of the Chinese concerns. Um, and there, yes, the most, direct, the most direct military solution is to you know, focus on the theater range capabilities uh, so that China can respond in kind in a limited manner uh, to a limited nuclear threat. Um, so I think you know, the DF-26, DF-21, the nuclear versions, they, they play an important role in this regard. The missile silos, I don't think they directly um, help in this regard, unless, I mean, I think there is this very generic belief that, well, as China possesses a much stronger strategic nuclear capability, right, intercontinental range nuclear capability, that would make the U.S. more worried about further escalation of a nuclear war. And that worry in itself could deter the United States from initiating a limited nuclear threat um, to begin with. So somehow there is an indirect connection uh, between those uh, strategic nuclear capabilities and uh, regional escalation management. Um, but I think uh, most important role for those uh, strategic capabilities is to demonstrate uh, strategic power in the hope that it can, they can contribute to the goal of changing uh, American um, assessment of uh, balance of power 
And um, so it's not only about deterring specific military escalation threats, but also very important about deterring or discouraging the perceived political and strategic aggression and hostility from the United States. Well, thanks. Uh, and thank you. So uh, China is doing a lot of things uh, in order to solve some problems, right? So at, at one level, the problem is of survivability. So I was wondering, what does, uh, why does not China think so much about its submarine force to solve this problem? What can you tell us about how China thinks about, like is it trying to build a robust submarine force and is not able to, or does it not want to build one because of some of the problems like command and control? So what, how does it think about this? I don't think China is making trade-offs, right? It's, it is basically comprehensively <laughs> expanding its nuclear capabilities. As I said, in 2018, she made a very specific instruction to the Chinese naval official that China needs to massively develop its sea-based nuclear deterrent capability, right? Uh, yes, the Chinese SSB technology is reportedly not as good as it perhaps wishes, but that doesn't prevent China from you know, procuring a large number of those less advanced submarines, right? The zero, China is already working on its third generation SSB in the 096 class. If China is not in a hurry, it doesn't need to build a sizable fleet of its second generation, the 094 class SSB. But in fact, China is building a rather large fleet of the second generation SSB. And so uh, that indicates the Chinese not only pursuing more technologically advanced nuclear capabilities, but it's increasingly you know, uh, interested in, in the size, in the quantity of its nuclear capability. I think that's something different compared with Chinese traditional thinking. I can interject myself here very quickly. <laughs> on, the, on the submarines in particular, right? The, I mean, the ONI-4 class, based on the 2009 ONI report, is like very noisy. Um, maybe it's gotten a little quieter, but it doesn't seem like it's a, a great deterrent platform, no matter how many you build. Um, and they don't, they haven't really built that many. So at least my my reading of one of the factors contributing to the kind of silo breakout was sort of actually not just the desire for speed, but also a recognition that if China wanted a more robust force and deterrent for whatever reason, including all the ones that you've mentioned, that it wasn't going to be able to rely on SSBNs to do that, right? It really had to go the silo route because of the lead time required to develop a much quieter, more effective sort of 096 class. And who knows how quiet that will be, right? I mean, naval reactors have been a huge problem for the Chinese Navy, despite what Xi Jinping might want, might want them to do. So I, I sort of had, at least my pet theory was, you know, the, the, the air leg of the triad's not great for China. They don't have a great armor yet. Well, can't reach the United States. Um, submarines, US ASW capability is very strong, not a great platform. So really what's left is expanding the ground forces, whether it's the road mobile forces and or in combination with the silo-based forces. So there is, there is still like an imbalance, right, in what um, has been emphasized. And that does ha seem to do with at least concerns either about the ability to develop robust l other legs of the triad or, or simply the fact that the submarines, who knows if they'll ever really get kind of a, a real capability there that they can rely upon mm -hmm. to the degree they can rely upon their, the road mobile forces or the silo based forces. Yeah, I agree. I mean, um, you know, that, that I think China perceives values in different um, types of nuclear capabilities. Um, in the long run, you know, they want to be able to have an advanced SSB in capacity. It will take time. Um, so, you know, China is, you know, so again, it reflects this sense of urgency. Um, so we'll 
expand land-based nuclear forces, we'll introduce this air-based nuclear forces, which is not necessarily that survivable. Um, um, and I think there is, you know, a, a trend that Chinese nuclear thinking is, you know, becoming closer to the American nuclear thinking. They tend to see unique advantages of different nuclear weapon platforms, and they want to pursue all of them. Um, so, yeah. Um, Sam, later. Uh, thanks so much for this talk. I thought it was really interesting. There are a few questions I could ask, but I wanted to focus on this question of what sort of the pur purpose of a larger nuclear force would be, what it might come into play, and the potential reasons why they might be concerned that the United States would launch a nuclear attack. And specifically, whether or not this is an indication about Chinese intentions around Taiwan, which some people have taken this as. So, you know, one of the most likely scenarios in which the United States might threaten nuclear coercion, where it might destabilize China's rise, is over a Taiwan invasion scenario. The Colby example, right, is talking about sinking an amphibious invasion fleet. Um, do you see this as evidence in one way or another about China's intentions with respect to Taiwan? About it, sort of, a, is it a necessary prerequisite to any military invasion? Or do you view it as totally sort of uh, separate from that or tangential in some way or another? I think on the military level, uh, <clears throat> there is uh, certainly a perceived uh, benefit uh, of a uh, greater nuclear capability uh, in, in a Taiwan Strait contingency. Um, again, uh, perceived, you know, at the nuclear level, the perceived threat is, uh, you know, we, we need, you know, we, we need to better uh, address uh, this growing limited uh, American nuclear coercion, right? Um, we have to have the means to retaliate in kind in order to deter uh, a limited American nuclear threat. Uh, the China wants to contain a Taiwan Strait war below the nuclear level, but it believes it needs a more flexible nuclear capacity in order to achieve that goal. And with more accurate theater range nuclear forces, I think that you know, directly addresses that potential vulnerability. Um, but again, um, this does not explain, you know, I don't think this is the primary driver of China's overall nuclear buildup because you cannot explain what's the direct role of 300 ICBM silos uh, in this Taiwan scenario. Um, so I think, again, it's one of the military level uh, rationales, um, but it's only part of the picture. Um, I, I hope, right. I, I, hope oh, I addressed your question. Yes, you Sam, do you follow up? Um, no, I don't think so. I think that addressed the question. I, <laughs> all the other people get their questions in. Okay. Uh, right, Smith? So in your talk, you mentioned that there, is, there isn't incentives to question this policy change because there's the significant amount of resources that have been made available to the implementing entities. I'm curious, though, is there any evidence of competition amongst the different military entities for those resources? I was thinking about the submarines and um, you know, whether there's a demand by the Navy for more support for that project, or is it such that the, the ground forces are the predominant, the predominant actor and kind of can run the show? I, I tend to think the silos would be uh, run by the rocket force. Uh, Rather than the um, the army, but you know I would be very surprised if there is no <laughs> com competition. Uh, but given the level of secrecy, uh, you know it's really hard to you know to develop um, real insight. Um, so you know I don't know. There is a lot of uh, green on the Central Military Commission. <laughs> Too, yes. Right. <laughs> I guess one is looking at service backgrounds. Um, uh, Lind. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, for your presentation. Um, so this is maybe a little bit far fetched, but I understand from your presentation that both in political terms as well as in military terms, this all seems to be very U.S. driven. And I was just wondering, in Chinese nuclear thinking and so on and so forth, 
whether there's any concern about like other actors, I'm thinking about Russia, but also perhaps India, or whether, I mean, I, I understand that the United States would be like the primary um, relationship that they're thinking about, but whether there's like any other actors that China might be concerned about in, in this realm and how we can see that perhaps translated in some of the things that it's doing. Well, I, I tend to think, you know, the, um, especially in recent years, uh, the primary focus is on the United States. Um, but it's also true that from the very beginning, uh, China wants to be able to deter all sorts of nuclear threats from all p possible directions. Right? There, there was, you know, for some period of time, maybe even today still, concern about, Amer uh, about North Korea nuclear capability that, you know, one day perhaps could, you know, pose a threat to China too. Um, I think, you know, at the strategic level, uh, I think China's theater range nuclear capabilities, especially the, you know, the newest ones, um, play a second secondary role of you know, uh, enhancing China's deterrence against India so that it could dissuade India from so-called opening a second front on the west of China uh, in a future U.S.-China, you know, crisis um, to the east. Uh, so I think in that regard, you know, there may be some connection between uh, you know, the theater uh, range nuclear forces and the overall evolving geopolitical landscape um, on the, on, you know, to the west of China. But in general, I don't see China being particularly more worried today about India. Um, there is still very strong confidence in China about its overall capacity to, to deter India. There is, you know, there is no growing concern about India's uh, growing nuclear capability. You know, there, the overall thinking remains that nuclear is not that um, relevant in China-India security relationship. Neither country is that interested in playing up uh, nuclear forces against each other. They both have no first use policy. They both have an interest in containing a conventional escalation. Um, so I, I think U.S. is clearly the you know, very obvious primary focus of China's nuclear development. Of, and of course, you know, as I said, the same capabilities, especially the shorter range capabilities can deter Russia too if, you know, if there's a need, but of course that need is becoming <laughs> less and less uh, uh, obvious. There is growing nuclear coordination and even cooperation with, with Russia. So. Yeah, I, I held off asking, getting on the list because I didn't want to take you too far afield from the, the dyad you were focused on, U.S. and China, but now the <laughs> the cat's out of the bag. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask about uh, two other countries where the conversation about nuclear breakout has become more pronounced in the public domain, and that's the ROK, South Korea, and Japan. And um, I wonder if you could tell us a bit about what uh, China's concerns, to the extent to which China um, is exhibiting concerns um, about the prospects for that, given that both are uh, treaty allies of the United States, and, and uh, it, it does connect to the United States in that way. Um, I'm not sure I have unique insight on that issue, but it, it appears that um, there is a growing Chinese concern about uh, proliferation uh, in Japan and South Korea especially the UN, the, the UN administration, you know, is increasingly having serious internal debates and discussions about the nuclear option. Uh, not necessarily indigenous nuclear, but, you know, 
senior officials are more willing to explicitly debate that option. You know, that sends a you know, worrisome signal to China. Uh, and similarly, uh, China thinks the US has been implementing um, selective non-proliferation policies in order to advance American geopolitical interests, right? US deliberately, you know, from the Chinese perspective, the US deliberately relaxes non-proliferation restrictions on its allies so that they can develop uh, better capabilities which can potentially be used to deter China. Um, so given the Chinese belief that U.S. is reducing its non-proliferation principles, at least uh, in its implementation of those policies, perhaps you know, um, you know, China should also prioritize geopolitical consideration than non-proliferation principles in its relationship with other countries. Just a clarification on that. Thank you for that. Um, I want to make sure I understand what that uh, selective non-proliferation policy applies to it. I presume it's India. Or are you talking about what the United States is allowing Japan to do? Also, oh, not relaxing the, the missile constraints on South Korea, et cetera. You know, um, relaxing the missile constraints. Right, and, okay. and you know, AUKUS is you know, AUKUS. a concern about Australia, too. And some Chinese experts are genuinely believed, uh, genuinely believe that AUKUS is basically a, a disguised effort to help Australia develop nuclear hedging options. I see. Thank you. We're at, at the end of our hour. Apologies to those of you I didn't get to. Um, but please join me in thanking uh, uh, Tong Zhao for a terrific uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much.